Coming up on iOS today, Rosemary Orchard and I, Micah Sargent, help you build out your iOS toolbox. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is iOS Today with Rosemary Orchard and Micah Sargent, episode 651, recorded Tuesday, April 25th, 2023. Build out your iOS toolbox. Welcome back to iOS Today, the show where we talk all things iOS, iPadOS, HomePodOS, tvOS, watchOS. Look, we talk about the various platforms that Apple provides and the devices that run on those platforms. We are here to help you make sure you are making the most of those devices that you buy. We want you to get the best possible experience on those devices. And when you're going, we who? Well, if you've watched the show before, you know who we who is. But if you don't, I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am Rosemary Orchard and very excited, Micah, because we get to talk about some of our favorite apps today. I mean, we always do on the show, don't we? Uh, we always get to talk about amazing, cool things. And uh, so, yeah, it's going to be good, good fun uh, talking about some other things today. Yeah, because today we're talking about sort of maybe less known, lesser known tools and utilities. These are not the the, the big showy apps that you see uh, constantly getting featured in the app store or the apps that you, and, and I, I would say in uh, many cases are probably not even the apps that you have on your devices. So this is a chance for uh, perhaps you to discover some new apps or to be reminded, like I often am, of apps that I've installed on my phone and then promptly forgot were there. So it's a great time for all of us uh, to learn about some new or old apps and features in certain apps uh, that can kind of build out that toolbox of yours. Just knowing they're there is, is very helpful. So let's kick things off with a well-known app, but maybe a lesser known feature. Yeah, so there is a great feature in Google Maps, which I've just realized that I can't actually uh, demonstrate completely because that's going to show off my location and all the locations of other people and some details. Um, but there is a feature in Apple Maps and there's a feature in Google Maps where when you get driving directions to a location, you can share your location and your ETA. Now, Micah demonstrated this a few weeks ago when we were in the studio in Apple Maps, but that feature exists in Google Maps as well. And the great thing about the one in Google Maps is it works across platform, meaning that when you are, for example, sharing your ETA and your arrival times with somebody who is on Android, then they can actually follow you real time, just like you can with Apple Maps. Um, now, this feature has been around for a while. It's been around for 2017, possibly means because we're going to talk about it here on iOS today that Google are going to kill it next week. Who knows? That's what Google kind of does with some of their features and services. Um, but um, this is a really handy thing. And there is also just straight up location sharing within Google, um, within Google Maps, I should say. Um, so if you just want to share your location for a bit with somebody um, and they aren't on iPhone, here's another way that you can do it. And that is really cool. And I really like that. Nice. Yes. And as as we mentioned, um, this was and remains actually one of my favorite features on iOS uh, in, in the Maps app that's sort of built in. But it is great that Google Maps also has this feature. It's very easy to enable. Uh, so depending on what you're using, um, you can you you can make use of this feature. Depending on what you're using, you can use it. Um, it is a great way to keep everybody updated on where you are. And I think it's just kind of a nice thoughtful thing to do for um, those around you who care about you and want to make sure that you're safe and you've made it to your destination. So yeah, I know um, my closest loved ones and I um, make absolute use of the Apple Maps version of this uh, just so there's not that concern that, oh, well, we're, we're coming to visit and uh, it's taken us a while to get there. Is everything okay? with this feature, then there's at least a little bit more understanding. And it makes me think, Rosemary, of way back in the day when you would get, you'd maybe get, uh, I probably via the Pony Express, a letter in the mail that says, um, 
We're making our way across the country to see you soon. We may stop for uh, a quick bite of jerky and some gold panning, and then we'll see you in California. And then you would wait 90,000 months for the people to arrive. And sometimes they would arrive and sometimes they wouldn't. And you wouldn't have answers. The, the world is uh, so much more connected now. And it's... um. It's, I, I, I would be a different person <laughs> uh, back then because, well, for multiple reasons, unfortunately, but um, one of those would be I'd have to figure out how to be less anxious about things because I wouldn't be able to get that uh, check in to know that um, that you know, the person is is making their way on their wagon across. We just got dysentery. That's what the uh, Google Maps or Apple Maps would say at the time. Anyway, I'm going to move on from being a weirdo about the past. And let's talk about uh, the the next feature. Did you want to mention just how to do uh, the iOS Maps sharing of ETA? Yes, yes, I will. So um, one of the things that you can do is just pop open the Maps app on your phone, and this works in CarPlay as well. And once you've got directions to get somewhere, which I'm just going to pop up before I open up my phone um, and then zoom out a little bit just so that I'm not showing off my current exact location here, um, is there is a Share ETA button at the bottom. Now, in CarPlay, this also shows up. And if you tap on this, it'll give you a list of some recent people, and you can just tap on one of those and it'll send some information off. Um, and then um, what you can also do, however, and this is something that I noticed recently, so I'm just going to end this route, is if you've got certain favorites, um, and this only works with some favorites, and I can't quite figure out exactly when this works with certain favorites and when this doesn't work with certain favorites. But if you tap on the info bubble on favorites from the list, so I'm just going to go back and show people that again. So. You're in Maps. Uh, I'm in Maps on my iPhone, and I've got like a map view at the top, and then I've got the list of things at the bottom. In Favorites, I tap on More, scroll down, and pick a, a favorite, and tap on the I button next to it. Um, and then if I tap on uh, Share ETA, then it will give me a list of people. Now, I had to swipe away from that very quickly because there are a number of people there with phone numbers, and I don't want to share all of those people's information everywhere. Um, but um, you can then just have it automatically share that ET your ETA with somebody when you start driving to that location. And that is another really cool feature, which I think uh, a lot of people will probably like. You know, if you all, always share your ETA with a person when you're driving to them, uh, then this is a nice way to just bundle that together. So there's no doing that or trying to say, hey, Apple lady, uh, share my ETA, and then trying to say the correct name. And Micah, no matter how many times I have told Siri that your name is pronounced Micah, she persists on saying Mika, um, which is kind of adorable and makes me think of, um, is it uh, Miko in uh, Pocahontas, the, the little um, raccoon? He's, he's adorable. Um, but um, you're not a raccoon. You're Micah, Micah Sargent. And, uh, you know, I figure you've probably got some things you want to share, too. Yes, I do have some things I want to share, too. So uh, one of the first apps I want to talk about, and I know, Rosemary, you're very familiar with this app, um, is a great app for managing and sort of being just aware of different um, time zones. So time zone math is the bane of my existence or one of the banes of my existence. And this time zone math is taken care of uh, thanks to a great app uh, called Elsewhen. So Elsewhen is available in the App Store for free. You can get it. I've launched it here. And your main screen is going to have um, a, a, a section called Time Codes. And I'll talk about those in a moment. But um, you can choose to include relative time. So uh, you could say, you know, 45 minutes ago, for example, or you can have it just be set to a specific time. And each of these uh, little formats here have the current date uh, in different methods. It also has uh, the the current time in different ways, and then also the both date and time. And these are um, special time codes that can be used uh, in particular in Discord, because if I remember correctly, Rosemary, the original reason this app was created was for uh, sharing specific times in Discord that Discord could then take and display in other in other time zones and formats. Is that correct? 
Yes, yeah, it was. So this was created by some lovely folks in the Relay FM Discord, actually, um, to use there. And uh, yeah, then some other features came along courtesy of various requests from various people, including Mike Hurley and others. And it's turned into this fabulous little completely free app that you can download and use. Yeah, so let's let's show some of the things that it can do. So first of all, down at the bottom, I could if I let's say I want to have a uh, podcast recording with Rosemary on Thursday at 11 a.m. my time. So I would uh, tap on the date. I would change it to Thursday. And then here I would tap uh, the time to change it to 11 a.m. And so we'll we'll make that adjustment. And then, of course, I am in the uh, America slash Los Angeles time zone. But let's uh, have that translate over to London. And so that would be, um, well, so it's 11 a.m. my time um, would be. That's 11 a.m. London time you've selected. There now, we go. Which is 3 a.m. in your local time. Thank you. Thank you. So there's, uh, and I'm going to show you in a second how we can sort of show different time zones. So this is the way to kind of get your local time zone all locked in and to have it um, displayed as you want to. Let me go back to Pacific time just so you can see here. Uh, I could add a custom format if I wanted to have a special way to show this, but we'll go over to time list because this is the real one. This is what we want. So here in time list, I have the option at the top to choose different time zones I want to display. Display. So, for example, I've got uh, the time zone or the, the current time in Los Angeles, or specific time, excuse me, in Los Angeles, specific time in Chicago, New York, London, and Rome. And then it makes a nice little emoji flag uh, down at the bottom with the times there. So now, because I chose 11 a.m. in my time zone, which, excuse me, is Pacific, now I know that that is 7 p.m. in London. And from here, I can easily copy this, uh, this, this little emoji flag creation. I could share it with the share sheet. Um, I could specifically save this group. And then I could make adjustments if I wanted to add some other options to this list. Uh, and then last, we'll pop into the settings just so you can kind of see, you can change the app icon, um, what your first tab is. And I'm actually going to change that to time list because I don't pop times into Discord. I don't think I ever have popped times into Discord. So I actually use this for the time list option. Um, and then you choose the default time zone. You can set it to what the device uh, based on location or uh, even on the, the time zone that's set in the phone is, or you can spit you can pick a specific time. And then it also has what's called smart time zone search, which uh, finds the closest time to your search results. So for example, um, I can remember growing up being frustrated because my hometown, I didn't quite understand um, why they used cities as the means of determining uh, time zones. I always just wanted you to be able to choose central Pacific, whatever. And St. Joseph, uh, Missouri, where I'm from, was not one of these cities. And so I always had to choose Chicago. And I can remember growing up being kind of bitter about the fact that I'm not from Chicago. I'm from St. Joseph. Why can't I choose that? But with the smart time zone search, you can essentially type in, uh, I could have typed in St. Joseph, and then it would find the nearest uh, option that's available. Uh, then, of course, it has the default time format. So if you maybe put the day before the month, then that uh, it will take that into, cons into consideration. The separator that you want between between the flag and the time, and then also including the city names if you'd like. Um, and then there's also an option to import a time zone group if you have that saved out elsewhere. So this is a great little utility, again, available for free to do your time zone math on your phone. And then the idea that I can just quickly say, I know what the time is, uh, and then paste that so that it, this is especially helpful if you've got multiple people in different time zones, right? So if I've got a co-host calling in from here and a co-host calling in from there in our little group chat, I can just post this and then we all know how the times line up. It's it's really handy. So that is else when in the App Store. Uh, what do you have next for us, Rosemary? Well, what I was just going to very quickly uh, do, Micah, is I was just going to show folks what that looks like uh, when you use the the copy and paste on uh, iOS for Discord. So um, I am attempting to show off my iPhone here. There it is. Um, and so I've popped in. It's just the current date and time. Um, and I'll uh, just uh, uh, set that. So there we go. We have this. And now if I pop over to Discord, this is the club to Discord. And I can just paste. Paste this little thing with like a T followed by 
It's actually um, a Unix timestamp, and then I just paste that in. But this, to me, says uh, 0126 a.m. for Wednesday because I, I was messing around with some of the time zone settings. Uh, but I'm sure that for you, Micah, that's actually showing a different time. And I'm sure for many of our listeners uh, who might be opening uh, the Discord uh, app on their phones or uh, other devices, then they would actually see whatever it is in their local time. So that's offset from me by about nine hours by the looks of it. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty cool feature. Um, and oh, the I next see. app that I was going to talk about um, is something that it's a niche app um, and you may or may not need to be able to just download a website so that you have it offline on a regular basis like me or not. Ever. But if you ever need to do something like this, there's a great app called Sidesucker, which is available for $4.99 from the App Store. And there's an iPhone and an iPad version. There's a separate Mac version as well. And what you can do with Sidesucker is just download a website. Um, and so um, I can actually, uh, I've got some historical downloads here, but if I wanted to download something like, for example, um, the Drafts app, um, which isn't actually on my list today, um, but that's uh, because I talk about it all the time. Um, so I will just pop this uh, URL in. Um, if I wanted to download the scripting uh, uh, data from there, um, and then I'll just uh, correct that, um, then it can just download that entire thing. So I've just popped in the URL, I typed it in, I could have copied it and pasted it. I happen to know this one off the top of my head, and it will just go ahead and download that. Now it's downloaded 101 files, and it downloaded it pretty fast. Um, and um, then if I pop into here, then I can actually just tap on the website, which is kind of a little folder, and then it's got this offline version of the website. So I can go around and just browse and look for things as I would usually do, um, at least as far as these things work, um, at offline. So even if I don't have internet connection or I've got a very poor internet connection, I've got a way of accessing this information. And that can be very useful for those websites that you kind of need to check out and have reference to. Maybe you're going traveling and you've made a little guide in say, for example, TripAdvisor or similar, and you wanna just download that offline. Well, you could make a PDF, um, but you could also just copy the URL, paste it into here, download it and see how much of it you can get offline so that you can keep an eye on it uh, as you go and find out maybe some other things as you are traveling around that you hadn't maybe planned to look at. Lovely. Um, that is a really great utility. I remember whenever I remember when you shared that at one point, I thought, oh, that's definitely an app I need to have. And uh, I, I've put it through its paces for sure. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun just to, as you mentioned, you know, if you if you need to have a local copy of something, it's a great way to, to make that happen. And I love the little um, settings that they have. It's very mindful about how you would want to um, download a site and sort of how many steps you want to take into the site to grab the links or what you want to leave behind so it doesn't have to sit and spend the whole day trying to get all of that um all of that information down it can it can just get what you need which is great um let's hear let's go with your next one before we we come back to me for my my next pick Yes. So my next one is a suggestion that I often make to people who are struggling a little bit with voice memos, you know, or transcription. Um, because transcription is great when your iPhone hears what you're saying correctly and writes down the word and doesn't get confused with homonyms and homophones and things like that, where things, words that sound the same but don't mean the same thing, like where, um, uh, for example, or read could be read, or is it read as in the reads that you find in a swamp in a marsh. What, what are you talking about? Now, Siri is pretty good at doing this transcription, I'll admit. Um, but every so often, there'll be like a truck that goes past or something when you're dictating and like it'll lose that word or a couple of words. And for those, it's nice to be able to go back and listen to the recording again if you are trying to make a memo to yourself. So for that, I use Just Press Record. Now, Just Press Record is available in the App Store. It's $4.99. But the beauty of Just Press Record when you record is that it will record your audio. So it's making a voice memo and it will transcribe it. And it can do this in multiple languages because I have had to decipher um, some intriguing answer phone messages left from my parents. Um, they, they are uh, in France all the time. So they get answer phone messages in French. Most of the time I can figure it out. 
Every so often, there's just a horrendous amount of background noise, but you know what? Just press record does a great job of helping me figure that out. So you can actually browse and open previously existing files, or you could, if my iPhone were still showing up on screen, I'll just uh, try popping that back up. There we go. But you can also um, just give it um, access to be able to record. I usually use this on my Apple Watch. Um, and then as it records, it will transcribe, um, or it will not transcribe as it records. It records and then transcribes everything afterwards locally on your device. And that is just brilliant. Um, so you can change uh, which microphone you want to use. So if you've got another microphone attached, for example, your AirPods, you may want to use those. You can choose your transcription language. So mine's currently transcribing into French because that's what I've been using it for. Um, and there's also some custom audio settings, like would you like to record things as WAV files, AIF files, or M4A files? And what sample rate would you like? Um, so for example, best available might just go with whatever it can do at the time. And you can choose to store um, things in iCloud Drive or on my iPhone. Um, I wouldn't go with the legacy in-app only one uh, for obvious reasons. It's marked as legacy. Um, as it plays things back, it will also highlight the transcript. So you can kind of like tap on a bit and, and go back to that. And you can say that it should automatically transcribe short recordings, all recordings or no recordings, as well as do things like automatic punctuation. And I just find this to be an incredibly great tool for I need to dump out a bunch of ideas, um, but um, what was it I was uh, doing last week? Oh yes, I asked Siri to add Periton, which is an antihistamine to my shopping list, and it added Puritan to my shopping list. Um, I'm not sure I'm gonna find that in the supermarket, Micah, but you know what? Fortunately, I was able to decipher that as I was going around the aisles going, wait, I need Puritan? Why do I need a Puritan? No, I think I need Puritan. Um, but uh, for those more complex things that you have transcribed or want uh, to make notes of, then just press record is my favorite go-to app. Lovely. Uh, the next utility I want to talk about is, I, I've definitely talked about it on the show before, but it's well worth mentioning again. It's an app called Make Pass. It's available on your iOS, your iPad OS device, but also on the Mac um, for $9.99. And that may sound pricey, but I it's it's worth it. Um, regardless of whether you use it, you know, two times or 10 or more than that. Because what Make Pass does is it lets you create wallet passes for Apple Wallet. So you probably are aware that you can double tap the side button and get your uh, wallet to show up on your iPhone. That's the way that you can Apple Pay with certain devices. It's also the way that you can scan, for example, your your Starbucks card, or if you have a loyalty card for a, um, uh, a grocery store or a gas station, something like that. But what if your loyalty card what if your favorite store does not have uh the option to make a pass for your wallet well you can do it yourself so i'm going to show from the examples because this is a great way to see kind of what is possible uh so i'll tap open from examples here and let's just look at example uh a store card um, so here you can see uh, the editor that pops up. You've got the title of the pass, the image, the icon image, background color, foreground color. You can make all of these choices. Um, the type of code that the barcode is, um, what information is in the barcode, and then also certain properties like the organization description and the group. And in this case, it's a store card. Uh, the image here shows some kind of fruits and vegetables. And then if there's a relevancy tied to it, which I'll talk about in a moment, that can also be added. And then last but not least is just a client ID uh, bit of information. And look at all of these fields that could be filled out. Now, I'm going to tap on preview because that will show you what the card actually looks like. So this person, uh, the, the grocery store is called Upmarket, and up at the top is the name. You've got that beautiful image of vegetables, and then the client ID, and then down below is that barcode for the client ID. All of this is right there. If I tapped on add, it would actually add it to my Apple wallet and be listed there with it. Uh, I'm going to close out of the editor, and I'm going to show a different example, like an event 
ticket. So if we tap on this event ticket, let's say that the ticketing system that you have has you like print out a code, but it doesn't have um, an Apple wallet pass. This is a great way to make that happen. So here, there's no header title, but there is an image, there's an icon. Uh, you've got the type of barcode, which in this case is a QR code, uh, the description in the group, and then also um, a thumbnail for the image. But check this out. This has relevancy. So this says that there's a specific date upon which this uh, card becomes relevant. And the reason why that information is there is because you can choose to drop in information here like a date or a location and the built-in tools in Apple Wallet make it, or features I should say in Apple Wallet, make it so that it will display based on this relevancy. So 10, 3, 20, 21 is a while ago now. Uh, so obviously if I added this card to Apple Wallet, it's not going to be showing as a, as a top suggestion. But let's say that the date was today uh, at, at 11 a.m. And as we're recording the show, it's 937, 937 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, then it would probably show that as uh, one of the sort of wallet cards that's pretty recent. Um, and then there's some more information there. So I'll choose preview just so you can see what this card looks like. It has the room, the row, the seat, and then the, the code down here at the bottom. Again, I could choose add to add it to my pass uh, or rather to my Apple wallet. Um, and then what I want to show here is there are some different tools. So you can start by creating a, uh, a, a wallet pass with the import barcode feature. You can scan a barcode that's uh, physically available. You can choose a barcode from a photo or from a file, like a PDF. And then there's a new set, a new system called MakePass AI. And MakePass AI uses ChatGPT, well, I shouldn't say ChatGPT, it uses GPT-4 um, to be able to sort of create a, um, create a pass based on either what you describe or based on what you capture. So I am going to um, show how this works in, in practice by scanning a barcode. Um, I, I'm, I'm showing how the app works in practice, not necessarily the AI version. So um, I will choose scan barcode and up pops my, um, there we go, the file. And it says the input barcode format is not supported by Apple Wallet. MakePass can convert the barcode payload to one of the supported formats or embed the barcode with the original format as the pass strip image. So I'm going to convert to supported format. And then I have some options here. Um, I am going to use QR uh, in this case. And so it pops that information, uh, that payload into the QR format. And then let's give this a title, which in this case, it was a bag of Hershey's Special Dark. So we'll call the title special dark and then the header image, we can um, select a file or select a photo. Um, and then the icon image we'll keep as the standard wallet. Uh, background color, let's do a deep brown because that will match the special dark. And then for the foreground color, we probably want to keep that as white so that it uh, shows up against that dark background. And then the label color, let's do a nice red again to match the branding of the uh, Hershey's Special Dark. Now I can choose an organization. So in this case, um, that would be the Hershey Company. So we'll type that in. And then we'll leave description alone. Group is default because you can set up custom groups if you want to. And I am going to make this a coupon. Um, so the pass image is going to be automatically shown there. There's no relevancy tied to this. Although I guess let's go with an expiration date. Let's say this expires on the 30th at uh, midnight. And so we'll set that as the expiration date. And then um, I could add some more stuff. But this is what's great about it is I, I don't know what else I might want to add. So I'm going to choose preview to see what it looks like thus far, which not too exciting. I want to, to make this more fun. So what we'll do is we can choose some different fields here. So we can let's go with um, chocolate. Actually, no, let's go with net weight which in this case is three ounces. 
And then we can go back and look at where that's adding information. So there in the top right corner, for example. Uh, and then I would go on adding more information. And as I go, kind of see how I want it to be set up, how I want it to look. And the last thing that I want to mention is this is great if um, you want to set an associated app. So let's say you have a, um, a ticket for an event coming up and they don't offer the ability to add a, uh, a, a, a pass automatically to Apple Wallet. You can create your own using this app. You can go ahead and make it using Make Pass. And then if you run into an issue where when you get there, they go, wait, we don't have an Apple Wallet pass or something like that, then having this associated app field filled out will make it so that whenever you're in that pass card, there's a little icon for the associated app you can tap on and then it'll automatically launch the app. So then you can get to the screen that you wanted to get to and have it work in their system. So that's a great way to make that happen. But I encourage everyone to consider getting this app and just playing around with it because it's a really cool app that lets you make all sorts of cards. I know a lot of folks who before there were there was the ability to kind of um, using, for example, in California, uh, California has an actual system that you can type in your information and get your uh, vaccine information as an Apple Wallet Pass. Before that was available, uh, I know some folks who used the Make Pass app to create their own sort of, as they called them, vaccine passports at the time. Um, and it was an easy method of doing so because they had the information they needed. They could put it all together in one spot and it uh, showed up in their Apple Wallet app. So yeah, uh, well worth checking out Make Pass. Very cool tool uh, available on not just iOS and iPadOS, but also on macOS. Um, and even from macOS, you can still add it to your Apple Wallet super simply. Uh, all right, let's move on to, Rosemary, your next couple of picks. Yeah, so my next pick is definitely a nerdy one. And I'm sure some of you listened in one of our recent episodes where we recommended using the keyboard settings on iOS to do some text expansion so that you could then take advantage of things like if you write the at symbol followed by the at symbol, then you get your email address automatically. Well, sometimes we want to be able to take things like that and just go a little further with them. Um, and so for that, I have this great app called Snippety. Uh, now, my iPhone isn't quite showing up on screen for some reason at the moment, uh, which is always good fun when that happens. There we go. Um, but what you can do with Snippety is a number of things. So to start with, I'll just show folks if I switch to the Snippety keyboard, if you're watching the video, then it gives me my collections, which are kind of like folders in which I can organize my snippets. And then when I tap on one of those, I I, which I only have the all. I've got a number of things here that I can do. Now, the Snippety keyboard is not a um, standard keyboard with the no various different input input buttons like Q, W, E, R, T, Y that you would usually have. Instead, it offers you a list of your snippets, a space bar, a backspace, and a return key. Um, and so if I tap on the one that says Rosemary Orchard, ooh, look at that, it inserted my name. If I tap return and then select ISO date, it gives me something where I can see placeholders. Okay, so I can choose, for example, Sunday, um, and then I can insert my snippet. And look at that, that's a date which has been formatted, so it's 2023-04-30. Nice. Uh, what about if I scroll down a little bit more and I tap on tomorrow? That's 26.04.2023. Nice. But I can do some other things as well. So if I select some of this, then I can actually change this. So currently the text I've selected is hello world. This is a test in all capitals. So it would be shouting at you. Well, I can change it to lowercase or I could select that and I can change it to title case um, or I can select all of this stuff here. And if I scroll to the top, I've even got a little thing for a code block where I can choose my language um, and say, OK, I'm going to say this is in Python. It's not really in Python, but that doesn't matter. And insert snippet and it wraps kind of what I've selected um, into a snippet, uh, a markdown code block. Now, to create these snippets, you might think, oh, gosh, this sounds really complicated. It's really not um, because uh, the folks behind Snippety have made their uh, spent a lot of time figuring out what they want to do to make this easy. So you start by tapping the plus to add a snippet. And then you've got this nice area here for snippet templates. Now, I currently have the snippety keyboard selected, so I'll switch back to English. But not only can I just type in here, so I could type, for example, Micah, um, and Micah could just be a snippet. I can also insert placeholders. 
So I can have auto incrementing numbers, which will be incremented, increased every time I use that snippet. Um, I can have a calculated date. That's how I inserted the date for tomorrow. Um, I can have the clipboard content. I can have a selectable date. That's how I did the ISO date where I selected Sunday. I can have a selectable value. That's how I chose which language I was using for my code block. Um, I can have selected text also used in the code block text transformation, that was my uppercase, lowercase, title case options, and then text variables where, for example, if I needed to write an email uh, to somebody uh, inviting them to a meeting um, on Thursday, um, the blah, 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 blah about XYZ, um, and I referenced XYZ multiple times in that email, well, that could be a variable that I can then just reuse and I can copy and paste that and pop that into that multiple times. So to start with, I might get us say two or three questions, like the date that it's going to be on and so, and you know, the title of the meeting and the names of the people taking uh, part. Um, and then those get reused again and again and again throughout my snippet. Um, and honestly, this is a great little app. It's available on um, iPhone and iPad, um, and there is also a separate Mac app as well. And Snippety is, uh, it's a little pricier. It is $19.99, but honestly, uh, it's just pretty awesome for, you know, the fact that it, you, uh, sorry, it's available on all of the uh, um, uh, devices for $19.99. So it's a cross-platform app, but you know, it, it, it does everything. It even does rich text options. Um, so if I change this from, um, for example, um, at the moment it was plain text and now I can change and select, okay, this could be JSON, JavaScript object notation, or it could actually be rich text. So it might have pretty formatting where if I type in hello and then I, I select it and I can format it and say that that hello is in bold. Um, and then the, the world that I'm typing afterwards, oops, uh, if I select format, then I can just say, hey, that's under, that's italic. Um, and then that, that, that will be a nice rich text template, which yeah, you can choose to put things in collections or not put things in collections, whatever you like. Honestly, this is just a very cool app where the developers have clearly spent a lot of time working on this. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it even supports Markdown, which I know some folks really, really love, uh, myself included. So take a look at Snippety if you are looking for the ability to have blocks of text that you reuse. Um, and uh, yeah, it even works with uh, keyboard shortcuts on your Mac. So you can press command shift space to find your snippet and hit return to enter it. I use this all the time for so many things. Uh, yeah, I have to recommend it. Snippety. I like the name too. It's just fun. <laughs> uh, what's next on your list? Well, next on my list, uh, I am just going to change the order of things a moment because uh, I'm going to pick a slightly smaller one, which I think people will like. How often do you go and you search for something on Wikipedia? Uh, I mean, I feel like I do this a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, recently I was looking at Cel Segoyan, a uh, friend of the uh, Twit Network and Relay FM and mine, uh, who is a user automation expert, software developer, author, and musician, um, according to Wikipedia. And Wikipanion is my companion for looking at Wikipedia articles. It formats things nicely. It gives you uh, the options to quickly jump down to those various different sections within the article that you might want to. So for example, I'm tapping here and it's giving me the various headings. Um, I can use the dot, dot, dot to see what categories this person or this article comes under and um, other things like that. Um, and I can also go ahead and share and just give this a standard share link uh, to Wikipedia like anybody else. I can add bookmarks to Wikipedia pages. Um, and not only that, I can also choose which languages I would like it to be available in. So then uh, if this Wikipedia page were available in another language, so I'm just going to look up, for example, Berlin, this would be a uh, a good example of something that might be available in multiple languages, then I can actually um, change this and just say, hey, I want to retry my search in German, please, and then look it up in German instead, uh, which, you know, if you are studying languages or, you know, speak multiple languages, that's probably quite, quite useful to be able to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I certainly like being able to just uh, quickly bookmark something if I want to. Um, and you can even bookmark specific sections. So I will bookmark the population of Berlin. And there we go. That's that done. Um, so there are uh, things as well. I can switch between this page and go back to the English version of it now. Um, I can also uh, change in the settings, which are currently hiding from me, um, how I would like 
uh, to view this. It does automatic light and dark mode. It kind of just tidies everything up and makes Wikipedia pages very nice and easy to read on mobile, uh, which is definitely an advantage. So if you're looking for something to improve your time on Wikipedia, well, check out Wikipanion. It's free from the App Store. All right. The last one I want to mention is a little utility called NFC Tools. And NFC Tools is, uh, if you've ever used Android before, you may be familiar with this. Um, it is simply a way to look at an NFC card or NFC tag or NFC device that you have. Um, and in the cases of the, the tags that you can actually write to, also be able to um, write to them. So I'm going to tap read and then up pops the built in UI for scanning an NFC tag. And so I've just scanned an NFC tag that I have uh, near my desk and it shows the tag type, um, what technologies are available on this uh, specific tag, the tag serial number, and then a bunch of other payload information that's available whether it's protected by a password, for example, the memory information, um, how much information is being taken up on the card, uh, whether it's currently writable, and then also the record uh, that is stored on the card, if there is one. And then I can choose to save this information out. Um, and so in this case, I'll say uh, desk left and hit save and then that nfc has now been saved to my saved tag so i can always go back and look at that and also compare it to what uh is currently on the card if there's anything there um the next option is to write so with write you can um write things to a card that offers the ability to do so i'm good before i choose out a record i'm going to choose more options just so you can see what's here um there's clear the record list there's import from nfc tag import from qr code save and load um import from the nfc tag is a way for you to scan a, a tag see what's already on there and then have that information so that you can add it to a different one if you want to basically turn a qr code into an nfc tag then you could choose to import from qr code um, and so there i can go into add a record and here are the different types of records you can add to a uh, an NFC tag. So there's text, if you just want to add some text, URL or URI, which will give you the ability to launch a, a site. So if I tap on this, you'll see that it starts out with HTTPS uh, colon slash slash, and then you could add what you want to. If you want to add a custom URL or URI, then you would want to choose the second one where HTTPS isn't at the start of it. This is a great way if you were trying to get an app to launch automatically, um, or as Rosemary is always talking about, um, or is sometimes talking about X callback URLs. Uh, if you know how to use those tools, then you would want to do a custom URL or URI. Um, Unit.link is a service that provides kind of a, a means of linking to different things, applications, which will let you uh, specifically by way of iOS um, launch an app. Uh, there's also social networks. So I could add, you know, my, my Instagram handle, um, a search tool. So this will essentially just make it a Google search or whatever search engine you want to do uh, a specific file. And so in this case, it would be a, a reference to a file that's stored somewhere. Um, email. So if you want to send an email, contact, again, we'll have uh, full contact information, but then they also break it down by phone number, SMS, FaceTime, FaceTime audio. You can add a location or an address, a Bitcoin address if you have that, Bluetooth, Wi Fi, uh, and then custom data. Or, and last but not least, it's shortcut, which again, this is essentially doing. Um, it, it's making a custom URL that will then launch a shortcut. Uh, but I want to mention the Wi-Fi option because this is a great way uh, if you want to give people the ability to quickly connect to your home Wi-Fi network, you could add that information to the Wi-Fi network uh, record and then add that to a an NFC tag or an NFC card. And then you can just give people the ability, they can tap on it and then it will 
let them uh, connect to the network. Now, iOS does have some built-in uh, functionality for easily sharing the network information with others. There are also loads of ways to make that happen, but I just wanted to mention that this is one way to do that. Um, I have used, the reason why I even have NFC tools on my iPhone, because most of this can be achieved using shortcuts and uh, most of it can be achieved through other means, um, is because A, I have it on Android where you kind of do need a third-party tool to do everything that you want to do with NFC tags, but also because I found that NFC tools was the easiest way for me to make sure that an NFC tag that I had before was completely empty of any information, that it truly was sort of reset to its base version. Um, the, the tools that are available on iOS to sort of make changes to an NFC tag are great, but actually sort of reformatting the NFC tag, I could not make that happen how I wanted to uh, outside of NFC tools. Um, NFC tools is available for free with in-app purchase in the app store. So you can get the pro version um, with the in-app purchase. But if you are looking for a third-party tool that's just kind of purpose built to focus on NFC tags and you're not in the business of uh, creating shortcuts uh, to do this, then this could be a great tool for you to use to sort of interact with NFC cards without, um, you know, needing to figure out all the different pieces you need to put together. All I do is hit a button, bop, see what I need to see, move on. Uh, so that's the last tool I'm going to mention. Uh, Rosemary, why don't you round us out here with uh, yours? Yeah, so I have one more tool that I'd love to mention, um, and that is PCALC. Now, PCALC, Unlike those of you who are watching the video who might immediately think that means purple calculator, right? Uh, it doesn't. It, it is a fabulous calculator, however, written by uh, James Thompson. Um, and it's been around for a very long time. There's a separate Mac version available um, and there's a number of other apps. Now, I'm just going to put this back into portrait mode because it does work in landscape and portrait, just like the built in iOS calculator app. Um, but it has a few extra functions built into it. Um, so currently uh, in my calculator, I have 42. Now, I got here by tapping on the button that's got 42 in a little circle and then going to the universal constants where I found the ultimate answer. Now, there are a number of constants available in here, such as the uh, Hackett number Planck constant. If I go back and look at astronomical, I could look at the equatorial radius of the Earth, um, and that could be an, uh, one of my constants that I need. And of course, uh, I'm a user. I have the ability to create and edit my own constants as well. Um, so I'm just using 42 for the time being because it works quite nicely for a number of things that I'd like to demonstrate. So pcalc, as well as having constants, has functions, which if I type the F open bracket X close bracket button, it gives me functions. It's got functions for complex numbers where it can do things like the square root and divided by memory and so on. It's also got financial functions where it can calculate tax, get your tax rate, which is 20% in my case, um, and do things like rounding um, and so on and so forth. Um, it's got memory functions where there's multiple memory registers built in. Um, there's special functions where you can uh, uh, get the Snell disappointment equation. If you've been uh, watching Map Break Weekly, you may know what that is. Um, there's also your standard trigonometric uh, func functions and so on and so forth. But on top of that, there's an A to B because sometimes you just need to convert something like dollars to pounds inches to centimeters, or maybe you need to calculate um, what gas mark, maybe not 42 is, gas mark 42 seems pretty high. What is gas mark five in Celsius? That's 190, that's a little better. Um, it's 375 Fahrenheit for those who are curious and not watching the video or not looking at this moment. Now you can also just do things like there's a one over X button, which will just give you whatever the equivalent of one part of your number is. So as I've got five, it's going to give me one fifth, which is 0 0.2. Or maybe I want to do uh, 19 plus 17.5% uh, and that will also just calculate that because there's a percent button built in. There's tape. I can go back and see what I was doing before. And uh, there's multiple registers. There's memory. There's all sorts of amazing and wonderful things in here. It's a calculator app with theming. Um, icons, all sorts of things. If you would prefer to have a green calculator, maybe your name is secretly Micah, you can have a green calculator. Personally, I much prefer the deep purple um, and the samurai theme, but you can have whatever you like. And honestly, this is a great calculator app. It is $9.99. There is a free version called PCALC Lite, L-I-T-E, in the App Store as well, which is 
free. Um, and yeah, it's it's great. Um, also, at some point, you should probably go into the settings and check out uh, the about section, uh, which does have a little bit of information about PCALC. But uh, if you want to know more about PCALC, there's a separate app on the App Store as well, which is the 3D about screen, um, which you can go to the App Store and download as a separate app. Uh, I do actually have this installed uh, on other devices, but yeah. Maybe you want to throw some flaming bananas and explore, explore some of the ma amazing things made available by Apple. Well, it's in about by PCALC. If you just need a great calculator to help you with calculation functions and doing the same kind of mathematics again and again and again, check out PCALC. And with that, we have reached the end of this first segment of the show. Uh, hopefully you found some new tools or were reminded of some old tools that you definitely want to make sure are front of mind in your iOS, iPadOS toolbox. Uh, we move along to the news. It is time for the news. Uh, first and foremost, Apple has uh, responded to a security issue um, that the Wall Street Journal has talked about. We've seen a couple of reports, or maybe even at this point, a few reports from the Wall Street Journal talking about uh, means by which a bad actor could um, gain access to a phone and uh, make it so that you're kind of like locked out of your phone. So um, let me just read through a little bit of this. It says, uh, I'm more report thieves can relieve you of access to your entire Apple ID just by watching you type in your passcode while you're enjoying a vodka martini on a night out. Uh, thieves gain access to your iPhone are able to pull your access uh, to your iPhone because the phone doesn't need confirmation beyond a passcode as to whether an Apple ID has changed from the iPhone. This means that they can change your password and permanently lock you out of your account. So essentially here, um, what what we're talking about is the second instance of a special kind of of um what do we want to call it it's it's a it's, it's social engineering in a way but this is sort of uh stalking behavior that leads to folks being able to uh lock someone out of your apple account so um you may have at one point set up a recovery key and um through the use of that recovery key, uh, if you don't have that information, then of course uh, you will be locked out. I think, you know, in all of these reports, um, we always have to be mindful of the fact that a lot of the times it's not as if someone is taking advantage of a bug or is, is, taking advantage of a shortcoming necessarily of the system. These are the, the standard tools that are in place to help keep you protected. And if you aren't doing your due diligence to make that uh, possible, um, that, that you keep yourself protected, it can lead to uh, something like this happen. So um, uh, Mr. Fresca was the one who had this issue. And it says... Um, he either needed to sort of figure it out with Apple or had to pay $10,000 in order to uh, like get it back from the person who was uh, doing the wrong thing. So um, again, this is by means of the recovery key. And it says, and I'm going to quote this, the recovery key first introduced by Apple to combat online hackers generates a 28 digit number that can be used to unlock an Apple ID. Alas, with access to the iPhone, even if the recovery key is already enabled, thieves can easily generate a new one and lock you out of your account. So uh, I actually want to clarify here then that uh, I didn't realize that that was the, the iteration this time around. So if you have someone's passcode and you can get to that screen where the recovery key is set it looks like uh the the thief was able to change the recovery key on the device and then obviously with a newly generated recovery key you had to have that information to get back into your account so uh, i imagine that's going to be updated pretty quickly to where just a passcode is not enough um, to change your recovery key. I thought that you had to log in with your Apple ID and password in order to change your recovery key. So this is surprising to me. Well, they so in the specific example that Imor is talking about, they changed um, 
uh, so they changed his Apple ID password, which meant that he they had the password then to change the recovery key. Um, oh. So so this is kind of the problem. I think it's one of those step things step. where um, this this is part of a, a series of um, things that have come up recently based on shoulder surfers, which are basically just like you have at the ATM. People could be looking over your shoulder, watching you type in passcodes and so on. Um, so using Face ID or um, Touch ID is naturally much safer than typing in your passcode or, or password all the time where especially if you pause part of the way through because you get distracted by something or you mistype something it gives somebody a little bit of an opportunity to actually see what you're typing so yeah make sure people don't have your passcode people don't have your password and generally try to keep your device safe um, and on you at all times don't leave it on a table in a restaurant where it's very easily easy for somebody to just pick up and walk off with uh, even if you don't think anyone's seen you enter your passcode they might be taking a chance that they have Yes. So this is, yeah, I, I, my bad on my framing of the initial part of this, because in this case, that does feel more like a bug that needs to be corrected rather than just the, the protections that are in place. Um, the fact that, you know, you do step one, which is you get the passcode and then you can reset the Apple ID to whatever you want it to be and then change the recovery code. That's a pretty clever means of going through that. So it does, um, at the same time though, there's not really, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the solution would be in that case um, because that is the means uh, through which Apple, I guess, I guess if the passcode is not enough to change an Apple ID password, that's what you'd want, right? You'd want it so that um, your passcode and you have to type in your current password to change uh, or to reset the Apple ID password. Hopefully that is or how perhaps Apple simply changing your forward. passcode or password would potentially block uh, cha changing your recovery key for even just a couple of hours. Um, yeah, that might be enough yeah. to do the trick, though. That could, of course, like all of these things, uh, cause <laughs> as many problems down. as it solves. Yeah. If somebody is genuinely having an issue with things and needs to just block and reset everything and they are the legitimate user, can imagine being very frustrated by not being able to uh, to uh, just go ahead and reset everything that needs resetting, uh, you know, when in need of doing so. Uh, we'll quickly hit a couple more stories. Um, Apple has, and this is wild because it's probably just going to keep going back and forth, uh, but Apple has won an appeal in its ongoing battle with Epic Games. Um, so, you know, this has been going on and on for some time now, uh, where at the last go, um, Apple was kind of on the hook for in, in its battle with Epic Games. And in, as of today's decision, um, Apple is kind of now being shown to be off the hook. So I'm going to quote uh, from the piece, Epic Games sued Apple for not allowing it to use its own payment platform instead of in-app purchases through the Apple through the App Store with Apple taking a 30% cut. The court ruled that Apple must allow developers to steer app users to external payment platforms, but concluded that the company did not meet the legal tests to be considered a monopoly and thus did not have to permit competing app stores for iOS apps. Both Apple and Epic Games filed appeals on different aspects of the ruling. Epic is appealing the ruling that the app store is not a monopoly, arguing that there is no other way for developers to sell iPhone apps other than through Apple. The iPhone maker, in turn, is arguing that the court made a legal error when considering the anti-steering issue. So, again... Um, it's just a back and forth where uh, Epic Games is accusing Apple of being a monopoly. Um, now we've got another court that is saying, look, no, um, the App Store is not a monopoly. And as long as Apple is op offering alternative payment platforms, uh, then it is doing what it needs to do. And that falls in line with what um, we've seen, on, I think, on a bigger ground from the, just these court cases in the United States, but in the external uh, factors like the EU, where they have looked at Apple's App Store and what needs to be put in place, like offering third-party uh, payment platforms. It's a lot. <laughs>
Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, but it, it's interesting to see what's going on here and that Apple are currently not considered to be a monopoly. Of course, uh, that may change, but they do have approximately 50-50 split with Android usually in most countries. So I'm guessing they aren't necessarily going to be a monopoly, at least from the perspective of market share of who owns what kind of smartphone just yet. But we'll have to see where it lands. Let's round things out, Rosemary, with a report from the UK. Apple is facing new legal requirements in the United Kingdom, but uh, everyone's kind of saying, oh, it won't be hard for them to make this happen. What are the legal requirements? Yeah, so these legal requirements are specifically going to um, uh, apply to firms that are deemed to have strategic market status, which will be basically the tech giants. Google, Apple, Amazon, that sort of company, um, you know, the big ones. Um, and they've got rules uh, that how they're going to have to work and they're going to have uh, potential fines of up to 10% of their global turnover if they breach these rules. However, um, these rules are essentially fake reviews, no, no, and no subscription traps. Well, my thought with subscriptions are Apple makes it pretty clear um, when you're signing up for a subscription because everybody has to use that same Apple's sign-up screen to start a subscription. And they've made numerous changes to that over recent years to make it more obvious that you're signing up for a $17.99 a week coloring book app type thing or whatever it is. Um, and they also send you uh, emails whenever your subscription is about to renew. If you haven't had one of those emails come through, check and make sure you're getting emails from Apple um, and uh, make sure your email address is right for your Apple ID um, because they definitely do send you reminders that subscriptions are coming up for renewal and all of those can be managed under the settings area of your iPhone or iPad um, and also in the uh, App Store. Um, so I was there thinking, okay, well, I'm, I'm thinking subscriptions, definitely not a problem. Um, and the other thing is tackling fake reviews um, and um, yeah, that seems like this is genuine, generally a problem everywhere. Sometimes you might be reading reviews of something on Amazon. For example, I was recently purchasing an umbrella. Scrolled down through the reviews, which, you know, there were hundreds of reviews at, and it was four and a half stars. Scrolled down through the first sort of 10, 15 reviews. And uh, there was somebody talking about a, uh, a pump for like pumping up your tires on your car. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, huh, well, maybe they just posted on on like the wrong item. That happens every once in a while. Scroll down. A lot more people talking about how great and easy this was to pump up their tires. It's like, okay, well, this is clearly a case. Maybe these reviews weren't fake when they were posted, but these reviews are not applicable to this product. Now, fortunately, we don't seem to have that problem in the App Store where you're reading reviews for, I don't know, for example, Snippety, and then you you, you keep reading and find out that this used to be some kind of coloring book app or something. Um, that That doesn't happen. But there are definitely uh, developers out there who are paying for reviews um, and so on and so forth. Not the developers we like to feature here on iOS Today, of course. Um, but uh, the looks like the responsibility for that, because Apple is taking a cut of the app sales, um, it's going to be sharing some of the responsibility for dealing with fake reviews with developers. Um, and so they're going to have to do a little bit of a better job of detecting and removing these. But at the same time, I have to say, I don't tend to see lots of fake reviews on the apps that I'm looking at on the App Store. Maybe I've just got great ways of finding apps in the first place, which are always trustworthy. Or maybe it's just a case of there aren't as many out there as people think. That said, anything that's going to be like a nineteen ninety nine a week subscription is getting a no from me just as a kind of <laughs> like general thing off the bat. I mean, there will probably be exceptions to that. There are plenty of things where the data costs that much money. But um, yes, uh, in general, yeah. Keep an eye on the price and uh, then check out the reviews from there. And uh, in the meantime, I suspect that this legal ruling would apply to how Apple manages things everywhere. But don't forget, you also see different reviews in the App Store based on the country you're in. So if you're in the UK, you'll see UK reviews of an app versus if you're in the US, you'll see US reviews of an app and so on and so forth. All righty, folks, with that, it is time to move on to Shortcuts Corner. Shortcuts Corner is up next.
It's time for Shortcuts Corner, the part of the show where you write in with your shortcuts requests. And Rosemary Orchard, the shortcuts expert, provides a response. The first Shortcuts Corner uh, bit comes from Peter. Peter wrote in last week asking about where uh, to go to learn more about shortcuts, to make the most of what was uh, possible and to kind of get an idea of how to build upon uh, shortcuts and, and sort of take it to the next level. And uh, of course, Rosemary provided a great response. And here is what Peter had to say. Micah and Rosemary, thanks so much for reading and replying to my email on your show. I felt so famous. I airplayed the podcast segment to my close friends who know that I am an Apple geek. I will look into the book and video Rosemary mentioned. Peter. That's wonderful, Peter. I am so glad uh, that the suggestions Rosemary provided are helpful and also that you had a moment of uh, recognition there. It's always exciting to hear from you. And so everyone, you should feel free to write in iOS today at twit.tv with your own Shortcuts Corner requests, feedback, etc. cetera. Uh, anything you want to say on that one before we move on? Uh, no, uh, just that uh, I'm really glad to hear that Peter is excited and is going to start learning about shortcuts. And I hope a, a number of our other listeners also uh, take up uh, the advice and uh, options offered from his uh, from his request, which was last week's episode. Beautiful. James has written in and said, hey, how can I create a shortcut for my iPhone 12 that will put on my home screen a link to a specific Google Doc so I can edit that Google Doc there? Thanks for a great podcast. I have to shout that because there are like nine exclamation points after it from James. So essentially, James wants a shortcut to a specific doc. And this is interesting. This is actually an interesting question. It is an interesting question. Um, and I do just want to mention that if you open the Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google, what is it, Slides um, app, mm. um, then you can actually star things um, and then have those starred items. Um, you, there's just a quick filter to get to them. But maybe you do just want a link to a specific Google Sheet or Google Doc or Google Slide, whatever. So what I did for this, um, and this is going to be really complicated, it doesn't even actually have to use shortcuts. We, we're not going to do shortcuts to start with. So if you just tap on the three dots on the side and then you copy the link, yep, that's it. Then you go to your Safari app and you paste it and you open it. And then if you tap on the little share arrow at the bottom and then you scroll down, then there's a little option for just add to home screen and that's all you need to do. Um, now you can, um, you know, you're you're going to have uh, this with just, you know, whatever icon it is. Um, you can, you know, sort of tap and hold on it, and then you know you can edit your home screen and you know move it around and so on. If you want something that's maybe a little nicer, better, then you can also uh, just pop into shortcuts. Um, I'm just going to go into all shortcuts and then create a lovely little new shortcut, um, and then you can just type open URL and search for the open URL action. Um, and then when that pops up, um, which it should do in just a moment, um, then you can actually just open the URL with that URL that you have copied. Um, so my little, uh, my shortcuts is having a little moment here where it's considering what is correct um, with life. There we go. Open URLs in the web actions. And I just paste that in. And then you can rename it to be whatever it is. So open, I'll call this I OS, oh, well, if I could spell iOS, that would be really good. You'd think having a podcast yeah. called iOS Today, Micah, I'd know how to spell iOS, but apparently I can't type it. Um, so there we go. I can now open the iOS Today sheet because it's only got one uh, one action in. It's automatically going to use the Safari icon, but I can still choose to use a different one. And so maybe I'll just pick a nice little purple um, and uh, let's go with uh, the little uh, piece of film there, uh, as in like, you know, old fashioned camera film. And now from here, tap that share icon, scroll down again, and then add to home screen. And then maybe I'll just change the name of this uh, on that home screen so that it's a little shorter. Um, and then I'll just call it iOS today and add that. And now when I tap on that, ta-da, it will open it. And because I've got the Google Sheets app installed, even better, it opens it in Google Sheets for me. Lovely. All right. Uh, the next Shortcuts Corner request comes from Todd. Todd writes in, love the show. I've been watching since the days of iPad today. I need some help knowing where 
to go with this. I use Obsidian, which is a great uh, app for my PKM for work notes, stage play notes, sermon notes, etc. It's the sermon notes that I need some help with. I want to write or build a shortcut or an Obsidian macro perhaps that will work as follows. One, I write on my iPad or type a reference. Two, I select that text, again, either with the Apple Pencil or keyboard or mouse. Three, I click a button or enter a keyboard shortcut that four, prepends the URI. Five, URL encodes the reference. Six, calls the URI. And seven, returns the reference, followed by a line break or carriage return and the output from the full URI with the reference. Thanks, Todd. So, Rosemary, with this one, I hope you will also go into a little bit of detail about what Todd is talking about for our mm -hmm. uh, less than technical folks who are going, okay, what do you mean prepend the URI? What do I do? What does URL encoding mean? And what is an Apple Pencil? No, wait, that one's probably okay. <laughs> That one probably is okay. But the first problem I actually want to get to is actually how do you even run this darn thing? Because this is something where trying to run a shortcut on something in another app where you don't necessarily have a way to just be like, hey, uh, I'm in drafts. Drafts understands shortcuts. Let's do this. Uh, it can be a bit tricky. So there's a number of accessibility settings. And if you've got like a, a mouse, like uh, I'm, I'm going to hold up my Razer Basilisk mouse here, which is a lovely RGB mouse. Um, it's got a lot of buttons on it. Um, but if you've got one of those, which is say a Bluetooth mouse connected to your iPhone or your iPad, then you can actually have clicks on a particular button, run a shortcut. Yeah, amazing. Um, what you can also do is use the accessibility settings um, to run a shortcut. Now, what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, just add camel, camel, camel to this. So now I've got the accessibility menu over um, showing up on my iPhone home screen. So that's showing up as a little dot. And when I tap on it, it's going to give me the option to do either Apple Watch mirroring or run my shortcut for camel, camel, camel. Um, now, obviously, you want to select whatever one it is that you actually want there. but being able to do that, maybe running uh, your mouse into a corner, a hot corner on your iPad um, to uh, pop up uh, probably a menu, a shortcut, run a shortcut that opens like a menu and gives you some options because you may not want this same thing all the time. That's probably going to be a good start. But I'm going to assume that we can, I'm actually just going to pop back and I'm just going to turn this accessibility uh, uh, assistive touch, sorry, the assistive touch menu off. Um, and I'll just pop into shortcuts and then I will get started because Todd has got uh, various things that he wants um, or needs um, to do. Now, I'm going to assume that what we're going to do for this here is we're actually going to just type the reference into the shortcut. You could share the reference into the shortcut. Um, and what I will say is if you do that um, and you you turn on show in share sheet, then what you can do, turn everything off. We don't want everything here. You could just say, hey, show some text. And if there is no text, ask for and then change that to text. So then if I don't have anything when I go to run this shortcut, then it'll pop up and it'll ask me. And that will give us our reference as a base. Now, I did have to edit uh, Todd's query a little bit because it was uh, quite long and included a very nice example, which I'm actually referencing here. But what Todd needs to get out at the end, which is what I'm going to start with, I'm going to start at the end and work my way backwards. What Todd wants is essentially um, three dashes on line and then his reference, which I'm going to go and use the magic variable for that shortcut input. Uh, and then he wants the result, which I'm just going to type all caps result here for the time being. And then dash, dash, dash. Okay. So we, we know what we're aiming for. Um, and then um, I'll just uh, pop that onto the share sheet at the end, which is just going to be my final option. We probably want to copy this onto a clipboard so you can just paste it in. Um, but I'll use the share sheet because then you can actually see what it looks like. Um, so now we've got most of our end result. Let's go back and look at this. So we've got our reference um, and um, Todd wants to prepend a URL um, and URL encode the reference. Now we're going to actually do this in a specific order. We're going to start by URL encoding. So URL encoding is taking text, um, for example, if I took the words Micah Sargent or iOS today, they've got a space in between them. Well, if you go into um, Safari or Chrome or Firefox or Edge or whatever browser you want to use, even if you're using Opera, um, then you and you type something and you put a space in the URL that kind of breaks it. Now, modern browsers are really good at handling this, but if you need to call 
some kind of magic service, which will then, I don't know, take something that you give it and give you a bunch of data back, that's maybe not going to do such a good job of handling the space. So we need to URL encode that short, uh, the, the, the reference that we're starting with so that we can actually use that magic uh, service to do this. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give um, our URL and I'm going to take this URL action right here. So we've got our URL encoded reference. Okay. And I'm just going to put, um, uh, I'll, I'll just put prefix colon uh, slash slash here. Um, and then we can uh, update this later to be the one that Todd actually wants. Um, and then I'll just put um, example.co.uk. Um, and then um, I'll just put question mark ref equals. Now, how this works precisely is going to be very dependent on the service that you're using. But the part that we definitely need to do is we need to use the URL encoded text rather than just our raw reference. And then this is where we, it gets really, really fancy. We're going to use get contents of URL. Um, and get contents of URL is going to take this URL. I'm just going to drop it in after that URL action. And then it's just going to do a get request. And then I just need to replace the result here in my uh, text with the get contents of URL. And that should be it. That's, that's literally all there is to it. The real trick is going to be in triggering this. But hopefully that gives people some ideas. Now, if I run this at the moment, this isn't going to work because prefix colon slash slash example.co.uk ref equals blah, blah is not a real website. Um, and I don't have a real reference to give this. But if I do run this, then you'll see I've not given it any text. So it's going to pop up and ask me for the text uh, for the reference, which I'm going to call iOS uh, today uh, 651. And then we'll watch this crash rather spectacularly when it tries to, yeah, unsupported URL. Um, but it will, you know, aside from the fact that I don't have the correct URL in here, this will work. And uh, hopefully give Todd what he's looking for. The trick is going to be getting it to run, uh, which you're not going to be able to do with a keyboard shortcut, um, uh, Todd, I'm, I'm afraid. That's definitely something that's not going to be possible just yet. But if you do just maybe uh, hit command space on your iPad and type the name of your shortcut, then you can run it through there. And we can include this example shortcut um, in the show notes um, so that folks can give it a try, though be warned, uh, as I've mentioned here, this one isn't working because that URL will need changing. All righty, uh, we're going to quickly hit a feedback and question before we move on to our app caps. Uh, so Keith has written in said, Hi, Mike and Rosemary. I wonder if the last updates for the Apple Watch and the iPhone have affected the functionality between them. It used to be if I had music video, if I had a music, if I had music, a video or a podcast running on the phone, uh, play, pause, jump forward and backward controls were displayed on the watch. That functionality is now missing. I've checked the phone and watch setups with no luck. And a second question, when set to always on, the watch display was always on. Now, if there's no movement of the watch, the display reverts to a digital time in the top right hand corner. Uh, I had no luck when I contacted Apple support. I'm wondering if you have any suggestions. I'm using an iPhone 11 Pro uh, running iOS 16.4.1 and an Apple Watch Ultra using watchOS 9.4. Thanks for a great informative program, Keith. And Keith has paid the pet tax. Um, Rosie, the resident vulture who is checking for food. So let's take a look at Rosie the vulture. Yes, Rosie is not really a vulture, but she definitely oh. is acting like a vulture. Uh, she is a rather gorgeous uh, black and gray dog. No, nope, what's nope, great nope. about Rosie, this? Is Rosie's a dog. Who's who's? I was prepared for a vulture. And then to not have a vulture is so funny to me. Um, yes, very pretty dog. Um, beautiful gray, black and white, uh, fluffy, fluffy doggo. Um, this looks like it, or this sounds like it could be a couple of issues here. Mm, um, yeah. All so kind of combining together. I'm really together. glad that Keith mentioned the, the part with um, the always on watch display not working and the time reverting to a digital time in the top right hand corner, because that made me think, aha. I remember this, this is low power mode. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in low power mode, your watch doesn't display very much on screen and things like that. And so I'm wondering if maybe low power mode is enabled on the Apple Watch, because that definitely sounds like it could be done. So what I'll just do if I just pop up my watch screen, uh, which uh, was set to my accessibility button just now. There we go. Um, and I can actually show folks how to change that. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, this could be we- causing all of the issues, including the play pause jump forward, not showing up. Yeah. Exactly, it could. So what you can do is if you um, uh, swipe up from the bottom on your watch, it doesn't have to be an Apple Watch Ultra for this, it can be any Apple Watch, and then you find the battery, which is usually displayed um, as a percentage, um, and then you sort of tap and hold, uh, tap on that one, then if you scroll down here, then you'll see that there is a low power mode option. Um, now, my watch is 100% charged right now, but if I go into low power mode, it will warn me about a number of things, such as turning off the always on display, limiting sensors, interesting connection problems, and it doesn't do as many um, uh, things. Now, I suspect what's happened here is uh, Keith may have tapped turn on instead of turn on for because you could turn this on for a day um, instead of permanently, or maybe he's done this via a shortcut. Uh, that's also a possibility. Yeah, that's what I'm um, automation. Um, or mm-hmm. perhaps disabled some of the other settings via a shortcut. But if you try and turn that one off, that could be a very good start. Yes, because uh, as you pointed out, not getting that same functionality where the play, pause, jump forward, um, that is one way that the Apple Watch will try to save battery by not communicating as much with the phone. So yes, this does sound like at some point that feature got turned on and you may want to go into the shortcuts app um, on your phone and just check if there's anything related to um, to the to the apple watch that's happening in there where you've got it automated to to make some changes and then yes the second uh option rosemary was exactly what i was thinking about and you've made a note of this in the uh document talk about auto launch audio apps yeah so in uh the apple watch app on your iphone and you can also do this via settings um on the watch but i'm just going to do this in the apple watch app um if you go under the general option, um, then you can scroll down and there's a little section here called auto launch. Um, and there is the option to auto launch audio apps, which would include the now playing app. Now playing is its own separate app. Um, and so I think, um, I suspect that this may have got turned off, um, or possibly, um, you may need to reboot your watch because it's not showing the now playing um, app, but I'm pretty certain that you actually can't uninstall that. You know, if I'm scrolling down here, uh, now playing is not one of those options that I can uninstall. Um, And so, yeah, I I think you probably just need to uh, have a look, make sure that that is enabled. Um, And the other thing that you can do under settings and um, general is um, there should be the option, was it under general? I've I've lost where it is now, but there is the option of um, having uh, apps uh, automatically go back to the home screen uh, when uh, you are not uh, using them and you can change how long that an app stays on screen for. Um, There are also options here under um, settings, display and brightness for wake on wrist rays, wake on crown uh, rotation and how long your watch should be considered awake for and the always on display. Um, Now, if you've been playing with one of those low power mode shortcuts, it may have gone through and disabled a bunch of these. So if that's the case, you're going to want to go through and change some of that stuff back. Beautiful. Yes, that. Oh, and it is under um, return to clock is the feature in general um, for whether it sw- switches back to the home screen, which is, of course, your clock face or uh, ah, you. Yes, I found it. Yeah, mine is set to two minutes. Um, there are some other options, Same. so I'll just uh, find that for folks. So that's under general. Um, and then you uh, scroll down, find return to clock. It's be- between enable handoff and bedside mode. Um, and then you can change it to always after two minutes or after one hour. Um, and you can also customize this for different apps. Uh, so, for example, if I scroll down and I find the Now Playing app, which is right here, I actually use Now Playing Plus personally, um, but then you can actually give this a custom one and give it after, say, an hour. Um, and when it's uh, in session, so, for example, if you're doing a workout or an audio recording or something, um, then it can make sure that it always returns to this app instead of to the watch face. So, worth checking out. All righty. Those were some great uh, Shortcuts Corner requests and some great feedback. And uh, again, you can send those to iOS today at twit.tv if you have your own. I can hear the music, though. It's time for Shortcuts Corner. Oh, no, not that music. It's time for our app caps.
It's the app cap segment, the part of the show where we place caps atop our heads to honor our app or gadget picks of the week. These are the apps or gadgets we're using now or have used at some time that we think are great and want to share with all of you. And as part of that process, we put things on our heads because it's what we've always done. So Rosemary Orchard, tell us about the cap atop your head and then tell us about your app or gadget pick of the week. Well, the cap on my head, it's it's more of a berry, to be honest. It's sort of in a um it's sort of in an astroturf green. I think that is the best way to describe this. And astroturf green is appropriate because at the front I have a little white pom-pom. Now this pom-pom is representing a golf ball because in the middle of my hat there is a flag which obviously represents the the hole in which we are attempting to putt the golf ball. I'm I'm guessing from here it's putting, um, uh, rather than anything else. Uh that's kind of the extent of my golf knowledge uh hopefully it was above par or below par oh! on par i don't i don't know exactly where i'm going with that but there we go i tried to throw a bonus one in for you micah uh my gadget pick of the week is actually uh something that is a little bit uh different this uh is a surprisingly for me not purple uh iphone case this is the moft magnetic case for the iphone um but this magnetic case is currently not um, on my iPhone because I want to show folks uh, the bottom very easily uh, and it's more easy to do when there isn't a phone in there. So um, what I've, uh, if you're not watching, uh, then this will be a little difficult to describe, but essentially at the bottom where you've got the hole for the lightning connector. Um, and then uh, on either side, you've got speaker grills. Below those speaker grills, there are two more recesses. And these recesses have got some little grips in. And I've just realized that I picked up the entirely wrong clip uh, from the side of my bed, which was definitely a mistake. But either way, that's, that's uh, a problem for another time. But there are, it, this comes with a lanyard, uh, at least when you buy it from Moft in the package, then this uh, uh, comes with a lanyard and then you can clip your phone into uh, this lanyard so that then when you are carrying your iPhone, you are no longer just carrying your iPhone in a case. Um, and this is a nice uh, vegan leather. This is the midnight blue option. Um, uh, but um, you can actually wrap it or just sort of drape it over your shoulder. Now this uh, strap adjusts in multiple ways. It's very handy. Um, and I have to say, it's a very enjoyable um, way to carry your iPhone when maybe like me, you often don't have pockets because women's clothing doesn't need pockets. At least that's what se people seem to think. Or maybe it's just, you know, you're wandering around the house and you just need to be able to keep your phone handy, but you don't want to like have to put it in your pocket every 30 seconds because you are just constantly checking the time or whatever it is. Uh, so I am recommending the Moft Magnetic Case for iPhone with lanyard available. If you buy it from Moft, you'll get like a bundle with both of them in. Um, if you buy it from um, the, if you buy from Amazon, then you may have to buy the the parts separately. Uh, so do watch out for that. Um, but it works with all uh, phone cases. It is MagSafe compatible. Um, and it, as I mentioned, a nice vegan leather option. Um, and I have to say the, um, the buttons on here, they are satisfyingly clicky and um, they are like, uh, uh, it's a little difficult to see on camera, but they are actually metal rather than plastic. So you can kind of, you can tactilely feel the difference. And there is a satisfying amount of resistance, but not too much resistance to pressing the buttons, uh, which I know for some folks is important. They don't like buttons being too easy or too difficult to depress. So I feel uh, like uh, I'm not going to be depressed by trying to press these buttons. <laughs> Uh, that is really nice. Uh, over on my side, the cap I'm wearing today is a beautiful straw cap that's uh, black and sort of a natural straw color. And then it has these uh, gorgeous little paper flowers on it. I don't know. I feel like the queen would have worn a hat like this. It probably would have been a lot more expensive and better made. But hey, uh, you know, it's 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 nice still, I guess. Um, the object i want to talk about today uh, comes from one of my favorite companies they make their products right here i should say right nearby in san francisco california um, it's sf bags otherwise known as waterfield designs and waterfield is always making new uh bags and storage devices all sorts of different containers essentially that you can carry with you and i've got a few of their bags but i was really excited to see um this new thing called the mason edc pouch edc for folks who don't know stands for everyday carry and uh the 
Mason EDC pouch. It's a, a small pouch that is big enough to hold an iPad mini. Um, it's got a nice zippered front where you can uh, stuff things into whoops into the pocket there. The front of it is leather and then uh, ballistic nylon for the rest. It comes in three different colors. Uh, but when you unzip it, inside you will find a nice padded pouch for the iPad mini or a similar small device. You could put a Kindle in there, something like that. And then it has a main pouch um, with two smaller pockets that you can slide things into along with, and I love this the most, uh, Leo and I talked about this on Ask the Tech Guys in the past, having a little key ring uh, area where you can specifically put your keys so you know right where they are every time. If they're just floating around in there, they're hard to find. The idea with this is, yes, you can carry it on its own, but you can also stuff it into a bigger bag. And that's what I like about it. It can be kind of um, organization inside of a larger bag because I have this tote that I carry around with me everywhere. Um, and having this inside with all of my smaller items in it is quite nice. And then Waterfield, one of the, the things I really like about them is that they are always using and or they're looking for and then using newer technologies for like fastening and and um, adjustment. So here on the side, you have these great uh, little clips for the strap. So you can carry this on its own and wear it um, kind of like as a, you know, across the bag. It is uh, kind of a sling if you want it to be. Um, but they have on the strap, and let me put the um, the little clip back on here, because this is a really um, sort of steadfast and sturdy clip, but they have this kind of, it's it's almost like a, I don't know, like a seatbelt technology. Um, you can lift this, this area forward, and then it's got a spring in it. And so you undo it so that the that it's not pressing down on the strap and then you can change how big or small the uh, handle is on the bag and what's great about it too is that i can wear this as i want to and then make a quick adjustment using that little area so i can easily move it to behind me uh, and make adjustments to the strap or i can pull it back in front of me while i'm wearing it because of the way that this is made and then it makes a nice really strong hold um so uh waterfield slash sf bags has um a bunch of bags that feature one of these special sort of adjustment clips it says uh on the back of it trimmers t-r-i-m-m-e-r-s because you can sort of trim or trim rather the length of the strap that you are using to carry it um this specific bag again made right in San Francisco with uh, this leather and ballistic nylon is available for $129. Um, they have loads and loads and loads and loads of different bag options. So no matter what you sort of want to do and carry with you, you can find uh, something that will carry, you know, your MacBook Air, your uh, full-size 16-inch MacBook Pro, uh, they've, they've got it all. And what I love is that they're super quick to come out with new bags or carrying options whenever a product launches. So for example, when the steam deck launched, uh, shortly after that, uh, they made a bag for the steam deck and I've got that somewhere around here. Um, they are always sort of innovating on stuff as well. So over time they've added new, um, new options for that for the Wii uh what is the the little Wii called the switch the switch thank you not the Wii thank you <laughs> the Nintendo switch um and all sorts of stuff so please go check them out sfbags.com sfbags.com uh to learn more about a this Mason everyday carry pouch but also just so many other great uh options that they they sell on the site and uh again if you are one of you know if you're a person who likes to uh what is it buy local um then you can also feel good about buying something made here in the united states and in this case in san francisco uh rosemary you mentioned that you did find the clip or the, the strap yes Yes, I, I I quickly ran and grabbed it just because uh, as you were doing the quick adjustments there, Mike, I wanted to mention that the strap for the the Moft uh, phone case um, and lanyard has uh, two um, adjusters on it. It's got, um, you know, your sort of standard 
messenger bag style sliding adjustment. It's quite a nice wide strap as well, actually. Um, and then on the other side, it's also got um, this quick release um, sort of pinch and grab option, um, which is great because it means that you can have it hanging a really long way down or not so long down, uh, whichever you like. And uh, if you weren't wearing a golf hat atop your head, then it would probably be a lot easier to get this on and just quickly sort of throw it over your body in a way that is comfortable for you and whatever it is. And then your phone is just always at hand, nice and quick and easy. And also uh, the the way that the uh, the pins remove at the bottom, uh, you can just sort of pull down, which pulls or pulls the, uh, the, the, the hook away from the case. And then you just release because it's just nice little grabbers. And if you didn't want to use this case, or maybe you've got a phone uh, that Moth don't make a case for, uh, the, uh, you can buy the lanyard separately and it comes with a little bar that you can stick on the back at the bottom of your phone uh, to attach it to instead. Uh, but as it is, I'm going to be hoping they make a case for the this uh, for the next version of the iPhone because I really like this. It's a great option for travel or just around the house. Nice. I just love that cap that you're wearing. That's so funny. It is so funny. Um, all right, folks, with that, we have reached the end of this episode of iOS today. I hope you've been inspired uh, and you are looking forward to trying out some of these tools we've mentioned. You can email us uh, anytime you'd like to have your questions answered on the show by uh, sending them to iOS today at twit.tv. That's iOS today at twit.tv. Um, please consider tuning in to watch the show live every Tuesday as we record this starting around 9 a.m. Pacific at twit.tv slash live, twit.tv slash live. Um, we think, though, the best way to sort of get the show, enjoy the show, participate in the show is by going to twit.tv slash iOS and subscribing. There you will find some buttons. Subscribe to audio, subscribe to video. You choose your format. If you just want to listen to us or if you want to listen and watch the show, uh, choose subscribe to video and then pick uh, your sort of provider of choice. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. We try to be in all the different places. Of course, there's just that standard RSS feed that you can copy and paste into whatever um, gathering app you're using. And uh, we do appreciate you for, for becoming a follower or a subscriber, depending on what service you're using. They like to use those different verbs there. Um, let's see what else. Oh, uh, now's the time where I mentioned Club Twit at twit.tv slash club twit. Please consider joining the club for $7, starting at $7 a month or $84 a year. Uh, when you join the club, you get some great stuff. First, you gain access to every single Twitch show with no ads because you, in effect, are sponsoring the shows. You are making it all possible. So you get all of the content uh, with none of the ads. You also gain access to the Twit Plus bonus feed that has extra stuff you won't find anywhere else behind the scenes, before the show, after the show, all sorts of great stuff there. Plus, Twit events often get published there. Uh, they, these are club Twit events, special events that uh, are available to our club Twit members and access to the members only Discord server. Server. A fun place to go to chat with your fellow Club Twit members and also those of us here at Twit. It uses Discord, uh, which some of you may have heard of. It's just a chat app, so it's it's easy to get signed up and, and uh, join the Club Twit Discord and uh, talk to your fellow Club Twit members. Uh, and as I mentioned, Rosemary Orchard is super active in the Club Twit Discord. We've got a few hosts who are regularly there chatting with everybody. So uh, if you've been wanting to ask someone a specific question or just chat with somebody about a specific topic, uh, consider joining the club for that. You're also going to get some other awesome stuff. You will gain access to some Club Twit exclusive shows like the Untitled Linux Show, which is a show all about Linux. You also will get Paul Therott's hands-on Windows program. That is uh, a show, a short format show where Paul Therott walks you through Windows tips and tricks, helping you make the most of your Windows machine, as well as my very own hands-on Mac program uh, where I will walk you through not just the Mac, uh, but also iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch. It's it's an Apple focused but short format show where we're specific we're specifically focusing on one feature or one uh question that somebody has. I just want to help you make sure that you're getting uh everything you all the information that you need so that you are using that iPhone or that Mac to uh using it for what it's worth, you know, making sure that you are really uh, as powerful, as much of a power user as you want to be. And then last but not least, uh, you will also get access to the newly relaunched Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson. Uh, so you can 
learn about the home theater, uh, check in on what are the latest and greatest uh, options for you in the home theater, and uh, make sure that your settings are all up to snuff so that you are viewing your favorite shows and movies uh, with the best possible uh, options. That is Club Twit at twit.tv slash Club Twit. Please consider joining the club. Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to follow you online and check out all the great work you're doing, where should they go to do so? Uh, the best place to go is rosemaryorchard.com, which has links to all the things I do around the internet, uh, including a link back to iOS Today and to another podcast that I host um, and books and apps and all sorts of other fun things. Um, the other places you can find me are, of course, on various social media sites, including Mastodon, where you can find me at rosemary at snailedit.social. And then uh, other than that, uh, yeah, hanging out in the Club Twit Discord in the iOS Today channel where some listeners are having some lovely chats with each other and including me in them, which is lovely. Uh, and where can people find you, Micah? You can find me online at Micah Sargent on many a social media network, or you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in this week. Thank you for watching iOS Today. And Rosemary Orchard and I will catch you. Uh, or Yes, 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 maybe. <laughs> we will see you next week for another episode of iOS Today. Goodbye. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here. In case you hadn't heard, Home Theater Geeks is back. Each week, I bring you the latest audio video news, tips and tricks to get the most out of your AV system, product reviews, and more. You can enjoy Home Theater Geeks only if you're a member of Club Twit, which costs seven bucks a month. Or you can subscribe to Home Theater Geeks by itself for only $2.99 a month. I hope you'll join me for a weekly dose of Home Theater Geekitude.